it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Neil J. Gajar, DDS, MAGD, all the way from Missaugua, Ontario, Canada. Dr. Gajar lectures on managing medical emergencies in the dental office, has been a lecturer of oral pathology and clinical instructor at the Canadian Academy of Dental Hygiene, and has served as a clinical instructor in the oral diagnosis and emergency clinics at the University of Toronto Faculty of Dentistry. Dr. Gajar is a master of the Academy of General Dentistry, a fellow of the Academy of Dentistry International, a fellow of the Pierre Fichard Academy, and a fellow of the International College of Dentists. He has served on the Disciplines Committee, QA Committee, as counselor, and currently serves on the PLP Committee of the Royal College of Dental Surgeons of Ontario. He is a clinical examiner for the NDEB, president-elect of the AGD, is certified in IV sedation, and serves as the official dentist for the Miss India Canada Pageant and SWOG Publication Group. It is Neil, it is just a huge honor for you to come on the show today. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and it's it's my honor and, and, and pleasure to be here, Howard. Thank you so much. So the bottom line is um, you've been practicing uh, um, almost 20 years. Um, podcasters tend to be younger than me and you. They tend. I, I always tell them, and I'm still telling them, um, if you're out there, email me, Howard at Dentaltown.com, and tell me your name and how old you are. And uh, what you think of the show or who you want to listen to. And I'm shocked that 25% of the people are still in dental school. There's even a bunch of pre-dental and undergrad. But the majority are all under 30. Probably only once a week or once a month does some guy say, dude, I'm as old as you. I'm 55 years old. Uh, but what advice would you give these young kids today? Because they're, they're kind of saying... Uh, oh, Howard and Neil, you graduated in the golden years, and um, now and it, and you didn't have any student loans, and now we're coming out of school with three hundred fifty thousand dollars of student loans, and there's corporate dentistry and insurance to switch from indemnity to PPO. And what 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 do you say to the young kids coming out of school today? Do you, do you think they made a good decision going into dentistry? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know what? Up until up until a few years ago, we were number two behind vets as the uh, as as the most profitable, most likely to succeed. We've we've surpassed that now. We are the number one profession out there. Uh, it's harder to get into dental school than it is into medicine. And uh, I think for those 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 kids that are in dental school and those that are thinking of applying, this is a, a phenomenal field. It's a field that you know you're not limited to practicing one specific thing. You have a whole fortitude of, of things that you can uh, you can practice. Uh, you can choose what you like and what you don't like. Uh, that's why we have specialists. Uh, and you know, it's 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 a challenge every day, and it's a it's a lifelong learning experience. Uh, Howard, I, I commend you on what you've done. Uh, you know, you've taken what used to be uh, you know getting together. And, and, and talking about things and, and learning from older people who have been in practice, uh, learning from their mistakes so we don't make the same mistakes. And you've allowed that to happen from your living room, uh, from your washroom, uh, from the kitchen, uh, from an airplane, uh, you know, and, and there's no better learning than learning from somebody else and especially somebody else's mistakes or somebody else's positive uh, effects that they've gotten out of a den- out of dentistry. So kudos to you, Howard, for what you've done. Well, the one, the one thing I've noticed in my 30 years is the people who seem to be fulfilled and happy and paid back all their student loans and crushed it always had the most continuing education. Like you, Absolutely. you got your fellowship in AGD, master in AGD, and I, and I started thinking about this show. And, and well, at first, is in 2004, I started saying, let's do online C because a lot of people are married, they got kids, they, they can't fly all around the country. So online C just seemed faster, easier, higher quality, lower price. And then I thought, my gosh, you know, they're in a small town in Oklahoma and their study club has one speaker a month. And it's usually one of the five specialists in, in the county. And uh, my gosh, so I thought what would be really cool is to go get the greatest dentist I can find and do a podcast so they can listen to that once a month study club on the way to work and then they could and then they can what listen to another once a month study club on the way home from work and in a small town in Oklahoma they're never going to get Neil Gajar to come in all the way from Canada to speak and now they get to hear you speak but but you mentioned learning um what was going on in your mind 
uh, to make you commit to getting not only your FAGD, but to go on to your MAGD. First, explain what it is, because the kids in, uh, in uh, dental school, they don't even know, they might not know what that means. So, so talk yeah. about what that, what does FAGD, MAGD mean, and why did it mean so much to you to commit so much time and resources and money to achieve that? Well, initially, when, when I started off, I was mainly, I was a CE junkie. Uh, I love CE. Uh, strictly because not only if you go to an implant course or an endo course, what you learn specifically regarding those procedures, how you can be more efficient at those procedures, how you can recognize early failures, uh, you know, and know when to refer and know when you're over your head. But more so than that, it's, what, it's the small pearls that you learn from being in a room with other dentists and other speakers. Uh, perfect example, a couple of weeks ago, you know, we were, uh, we were in Chicago at a meeting and, you know, one of the new dentists that were starting off an office had a question of whether he should buy a, a Panorex. And my answer to him is you'd be crazy not to buy it. He said, oh, it's expensive and, you know, you know what, what about my return and, you know, I'm going to be paying off more debt. Well, the Panorex is a gold mine. It's literally a machine you put a patient in and like an ATM, it spits out money. And not to say that it's all about money. You know, it, it, is, it is good ROI and, it, it, and it, it is something that every dentist should have in their office, specifically because the diagnostic information that comes out of it. You know, just a couple of months ago in our office, you know, we found an ameloblastoma. On top of that, one of our orthodontists on staff here diagnosed on an eight-year-old juvenile arthritis by degeneration of the condyles. Now, a $60 pan is worth its weight in gold at, at that point from patient, uh, you know, health and, uh, and treatment. So not only is it a, a good thing to have, it's, it's for the dentist, it's a great thing to have for the patient. And, and as such, you know, that dentist walked away thinking that, you know what, this is one thing I should invest in. You know, I think back to the fact that this profession is so great, you know, there are companies out there paying 11 times a beta for a dental office. And then you hear people talking about, well, you know what, I'm going to sell, I'm going to get into real estate, and I'm going to buy some apartments and rent them out. Every business has its problems, but this is the most profitable business out there. With, any, with more money, there's always more stress, but, you know... Hopefully, you love this profession and you love what you do, and and you know there's no stress associated with it. So I would I would encourage everybody to to concentrate on, the, on what they've been trained to do and, and and do it well. Okay, my job is to ask the questions that I think they're thinking right now, and I know you just said EBITDA, and that flew over there a lot of heads. EBITDA. Earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. So that means say say your your business at a dollar. And you made ten cents. Now you still would have to um, have depreciation, interest, taxes, amortization. But uh, um, but yeah, um, that's true. And a lot of dentists are crying and whining that you know the average dentist in America only makes one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars a year. What percent of the United States and Canada do the people? What percent of the people would just think making one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars a year was mind-boggling? I think a big chunk of it, and I think oh, we yeah. take it for granted. Oh, well, I think ninety-five percent make- would trade for that any day, and usually Absolutely. the guys doing that have three-day weekends. That's right. I mean, to make a hundred thousand dollars a year, you usually got to be a workaholic salesman working, you know, twelve hours a day, seven days a week. Um, but you're absolutely right about the CE junkies. The CE junkies always seem to do the best. Yeah. Because they do more procedures, and this is a this is a field where when you move your hands, you make money, and the more you're moving your hands, the more money you're making. I want I want to ask you a big controversial thing about the AGD. Um, yes. So so this this young kid goes and takes an endo course and thinks, my God, that was really cool. I want to try. Then and the next patient comes in and they got a uh, uh, needs a root canal on a second molar, and she's like. I'm really motivated. I want to tackle that. But then her endodontist is making her feel bad and say, well, you should put the patient first, and I'm an endodontist, and I should do that second molar, and you should not do that. That is over your head. So the bottom line is, did the endodontist, were they born 
with a hundred second molars under their belt? I mean, did an endodontist ever do their first second molar? How do you justify the ethics of the really motivated who says, well, I know it's impacted wisdom teeth, but I, I really want to try to do it myself. And then the associate in the same clinic saying, oh, come on, you can't pull that. You need to refer that over to Neil. You know, he, he's been doing this for 20 years. So how do, how do you reconcile the ethics of that situation of wanting to try something that's probably over your head and referring? You know, Howard, it's called practicing dentistry for a reason. And, and that's what we're doing. We're practicing every day. Even though we're trained to do the simplest filling, we learn something different every day. We learn a different way of doing it. We learn an easier, more efficient way of doing it. You know, working on kids, we learn different ways of doing it. When you go out and do a course, you know, your, your level of education, awareness, understanding becomes higher. And as such, you know what? You should have the confidence to tackle something. I'm not saying tackle something that's way, you think that's way beyond your scope. Take baby steps. Learn, gain confidence. You'll be surprised. You know what? When implants first came out, oh, you can't do these. You can't do these. Who's no? Who's knocking in the majority of implants right now? It's general dentists. You know, it's you know things are going to change down the road, and it's our job as dentists to stay con- current with continuing education, to learn new techniques. That's what we're trained to do: to lo- learn new techniques and deliver them to our patients, and. Yes, there, there's a need for specialists, but that doesn't mean every simple extraction has to be referred out to an oral surgeon. That's not justice to a patient either, you know, to be sedated, to, to pay extra for the higher level of training that a general dentist can potentially do. And so there's a lot of ethical questions, you know, but, and if you're in a small town where, you know, it's going to take four hours to fly out to see a specialist, what do you do? When your patient comes to you and say, Doc, I can't afford to see a specialist. I know you've told me I want you to take the best attempt. Otherwise, that tooth is going to be extracted. What do you do, Howard? What's the best thing for the patient? So what what are you most passionate about today? What are you out there lecturing on? What 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 makes you wake up and want to run twenty red lights on the way to work? You know what 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 especially here in, in, in Canada, it's it, the practice of dentistry has become very competitive, especially in large cities. There's a dentist on all four corners of every intersection. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that interests me. And on top of that, we have the turf wars. You know, the endodontist thinks that they should be placing implants because the implant looks like a root. The periodontist thinks they need to place the implants because it's in the gums. The surgeons think that they need to do it because it's drilling into bone. And, you know, the prosthodontists think it's load-bearing, so they need to have full control load. And then the general dentist is there thinking, you know what, we do all of these things, so we'll, we'll take care of everything in-house. Um, you know, it's, it, what differentiates one practice over another? Why is there a lineup outside practice A and nobody seen, being seen at practice B? These are the things that, that motivate me. And, you know, I've, I've taken a number of courses that you've uh, uh, promoted. Uh, you know, I, we've signed up for Jay Geyer's uh, series, for instance, and we've learned an incredible amount of information just from recording the phone calls right in the front desk. You know, we have a receptionist pick up the call and say, hey, uh, somebody goes, do you have an appointment for a cleaning today? Uh, no, not today. And hang up the phone. No callback information, no contact information, you know, Make room for the patient. So be it a hygienist has to stay an extra hour at the end of the day. You know, these are the things. I see offices out there where I'm calling my friends and nobody's picking up the phone because everybody's on lunch from 12 to 1. Have one person out there answering the phones. You know, you're losing patients before they even come in the door. You know, so small things like that. And I, I have a passion for, for telling people, you know, what they can do better, what we've done wrong, what we've learned from it. And how potentially it'll help you, and 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 that's my my drive. My drive is to make dentistry better for both dentists and patients. So you're talking about Jay Geyer of the Scheduling Institute, and he has uh, been doing it in about 20 years in Atlanta, and now he has an institute um, in um, um, Phoenix, right here in my backyard. But yeah, that's something that what I like the most about the FAGD 
is when I was a young baby dentist, I got out of school at 24, um, and I signed up for that only because I thought the best role model dentist that I had met, they all had their MAGD. So I said, okay, I'm going to be like them. And um, they force you to take these courses in like 16 different areas. And I was arguing with them. I was saying, well, I don't want to take classes in implants and ortho because I don't do that. And these older people say, yeah, but you need to learn that. I said, well, it's a waste of time to learn that if I didn't do that. But they were wiser than me, and I was humble, so I did it. And I, and the funniest thing about the implant deal is I was so mad because, like, I had to take, like, all these hours. And I thought, okay, the only way I can knock this, I found this this course. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy called Carl Misch. And yes. uh, I, could, I could go to his institute and knock out all my requirements. So that's the only reason I signed up for it. I went out there, my God, it was love at first sight. I fell in love with Carl in like eight seconds. And it was like I told people, it was like I was discovered this new continent called, you know, uh, Africa or Asia uh, by being forced to do that. And the other thing is business. I'm trying to lead these dentists into business because like the scheduling suit, they don't realize that three people have to call your office before your receptionist can convert one to come in. Well, how? That's a huge funnel. Your practice could be three times bigger if she could convert them all to come in. But dentists, they don't usually um, like to think about that. But that's schedulinginstitute.com. And I was even bad with that. My dentist buddy uh, that I met at Creighton University in 1981 uh, as a dentist across the street from me, Tom Mattern, he told me for like I don't know, five, six years, dude, you got to go to the scheduling soon. I'm like, eh. And uh, finally, he said, uh, if you go, I'll go with you. I've been doing it. So I went down there, and that's when I met Jay Geyer. And that that just changed our whole practice because the guy who's doing the best root canal doesn't necessarily have the best, busiest office, right? It's what patients think of you, you know. Uh, They don't know the technical aspect of dentistry. They know you. Did you hurt them? Did you care about them? You know, did you take care of them? That's the bottom line. You know, it's bedside manner, chairside manner. Yeah, no doubt. So what, what are you lecturing on there? Are you lecturing on, what, what are you lecturing on these days? So I do medical emergencies um, uh, in the dental office. I do uh, CPR training. Um, and as well, I do, uh, we do WIMIS uh, for the uh, offices uh, up here because that's a requirement for by health and safety and all dental staff need to be trained in it. So I con- concentrate on the kind of bread and butter things that dentists need. They don't want to go through long extended courses and make it applicable to, to dental offices. And so when we're sharing, we, we, we go on a lot of asides and, and speak about things like, okay, you know what? Not everybody needs to take a lunch from 12 to 1. Uh, if you have a pan, get a pan, you know. Uh, if you're not involved in the AGD, get involved in the AGD. You, you know, you increase your knowledge on a broad spectrum of, of things. Like you said, the fellowship uh, is basically you have to take so many hours of, of lecture in, in so many disciplines for a total of 500 hours. On top of that, you have to take a, uh, an exam. Uh, and then after that, you can, ta- you can become a master of the academy, which is another 600 hours. And a big chunk of those are in hands-on participation courses. So you actually get your, your, your fingers wet and, and, and actually do uh, live treatments on patients and, and, and uh, mannequins and, and models. So, uh, you know, having a master's is definitely, you know, setting yourself aside from the crowd. You're, you're doing a lot more and you're understanding a lot more. Even if you're not doing a lot more, at least you're giving your patients more options. Well, you know, you lecture about something that is, to me, is actually frightening. You, you, you lecture on medical emergencies and you're certified in IV sedation, and that is the one thing that going 30 years ago, I, I just didn't, wouldn't do because it seemed like whenever dentistry made the news, somebody died, and if they died, it was usually related to IV sedation. And I used to always think to myself, you know, I just don't, I mean, I can do a crown, and maybe worst case scenario, it doesn't fit. I can do a filling, maybe worst case scenario, it, it's sensitive, but gosh darn, I've, I still won't do IV sedation. So what, what, do you, what do you think of dentists doing IV sedation, and how does that tie into your medical emergency training? You know, and, and would you recommend some young baby, 25-year-old who just got out of dental kindergarten, 
do you recommend that she should learn IV sedation? Is, is this something you think should be a goal for her or do you think or not? You know, I think any education is good education. And the fact that if you learn IV sedation, even if you choose not to practice IV sedation, you know, you can practice oral sedation because you have a higher level of training and that will help you with oral sedation, mild to moderate sedation, you know, nitrous oxide. You know, you've learned, you've learned pretty much everything less than, than the general anesthesia aspect of it. And, it, and it, you know, it's those, that training that hopefully will prevent any medical emergency from even arising. And so I think even if you practice or don't practice, you know, it, it, it's good training to have. Uh, you know, the, the problem becomes is, is not the, the actual IV sedation, but the dosages, the multiple drugs uh, that, are, that are given. In Canada, in Ontario specifically, we are limited to giving one drug by IV sedation, and, and, and typically that's Versed, midazolam. Uh, you know, in certain U.S. states, you know, you start adding multiple drugs to to the formula. And that's sometimes when you get into to problems. Um, I know the, there's, there's a lot of changes and there have been a lot of changes in, in what's required for monitoring and uh, IV sedation, which, which is a good thing, uh, you know, but more so than anything, it's, it's, it's controlling what, what drug and how much of it you give. Uh, touch wood, like local anesthetic, Versed is a phenomenally safe drug with a huge therapeutic window. But like anything, if you abuse it, then you find yourself in trouble. So there's a time and place for it. You know, is it applicable to kids? You know, that's where you start changing the dynamics and you have to be very careful. And you, you should have more training before you start tackling on, uh, you know, uh, sedation routes for kids because people think that kids are a small adult but they're not a small adult their physiology is completely different and as such they need to be treated differently you know when a, when, a, when an adult starts crashing that would thrive to live and they'll come back when a child starts crashing you know when a pulse oximeter hits 90 you're in trouble and, and you know you got to recognize that and you better be ready to treat it and know what you know what needs to be done to be back I think the most interesting. Well, it, is, it is more challenging. I think one of the most interesting things is I like to really, really study the only three corporate dental chains on earth that are publicly traded because that's a very sophisticated game, and there are none in the United States or Canada. There's only two in Australia: um, one three hundred smiles and dental. Is it Dental Pacific Smiles? Pacific Smiles Group in Australia and one three hundred smiles. And then what's the one in uh, Singapore? H M H and M Q and M and what I found entirely fascinating about them is in order to get through the investment community and Wall Street and all those people, they're not allowed to do IV sedation on patients under 12 or over 65 because when they look at the paradigm of risk, you just were talking about pediatric dentists where right. they don't have the lung reserve capacity that you know a 21-year-old would have. So their lawyer said, no, we're not, you, know, you can't do under 12 over 65. And I thought, man, that is but, – but did you just say – that in Canada, when you when dentists do IV sedation, they're only allowed to use one drug, and that's Versed. We typically one one drug is what you're allowed. Typically, the drug of choice is Versed, and now that's for a general practitioner. We also have a specialty of dental anesthesiologists. They're not limited in the in the drugs of choice. And what about oral surgeons and periodontists or oral? Same, oral same thing with oral surgeons. They're not limited in how much drug they can drop or. The number of drugs that they, they so so at. the one only one drug at a time is only for general dentists, and the specialist and dental anesthesiologists can use do whatever they want. Dental anesthesiologists and oral surgeons, yes. Oh, just de just dental anesthesiologists and oral surgeons. Yes. So not not periodontist. Not periodontist. Wow. And um, so, what is the um, to you? What is the pro and con versus? Me, if I want it, I will just have a dentist anesthesiologist come in my office versus uh, these kids listening to you today saying, learn it yourself. What, what, what would your advice be on that? Well, we do have a dental anesthesiologist that comes to our office, and that's predominantly to treat kids. Uh, you know, it's much safer for them to be under general anesthesia with an anesthesiologist, and in Canada, like I said, we have uh, dental anesthesiologists that are 
uh, that's a specialty. And uh, we're lucky enough to have dental anesthesiologists come sedate kids while we treat uh, our, our pediatric patients. Um, you know, to those, to those that are looking at IV sedation, it's a fantastic, fantastic tool to learn. Uh, you know, whether you will practice it and how much you'll practice it, that's up to the individual operator. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing. When I did the, uh, the, anesthesia, the IV sedation course at the uh, University of uh, Georgia Medical School, the one thing I learned more than IV sedation was extraction of complicated wisdom teeth. And when I came out of that two-week course, I was pretty much extracting 98% of the wisdom teeth that, uh, that were in my office. Uh, because I've seen it, I had the confidence, and, you know, uh, I learned it. Uh, so sometimes when you go in for a course and you go in for a specific modality, you end up learning something completely different. So while IV sedation was great and while I do have an anesthesiologist comes to the office now and takes care of the kids and, and very rarely actually practice on, on adults because of that fact, you know, what I learned from it ended up turning its ROI multiple times because of the fact that we do so many extractions. And that is what is so great about joining the AGD is that, you know, you're always going to be a summary of the five people you spend the most time with. So if you're out there golfing on weekends with three dentists who flip and hate dentistry, that's going to drag you down. And I thought the coolest thing about the AGD is that every time in Phoenix I went to an AGD course, it was the same people. And you're right. You could be listening to a course on red while the guy next to you is saying, my God, have you seen blue? You got to see, you know, you got to do this. But you were just always hanging out with people who had a positive attitude. You know, like they say, the most, uh, the most valuable real estate in the world is the six inches that lives between your ears. And if the guy sitting on each side of you is whispering the hottest stuff into your hottest real estate, you're just more fired up, you know, tr uh, higher on attitude, trained for skill. And I, I thought the best thing about the AGD was the social side of it, just running with people who were going for it. And, and, and you'd be sitting there. I remember when I was learning implants and my friend was already doing all on four. And I'm like, damn, I'm a year older than him. I'm, I'm, I'm baby stepping into an implant and he's doing all on four. You know, you just, you just really realize um, how much you could go. Um, besides Versed, what would be the next most common one drug used at a time? For, for uh, oral surgeons, it's, it's typically a uh, profile, but for general dentists, uh, in, in lieu of uh, Versed, it's fentanyl. It's what? Fentanyl. Oh, fentanyl. Yeah. And that's, uh, that, that's like the most uh, abused drug in Oxycontin and fentanyl. That's a crisis. Right. I always thought that was weird that Michael, ja of all the drugs in the world, that Michael Dr Jackson got addicted to propanol. Well, isn't that kind of bizarre? Yeah. I mean, that was just, uh, that, that's just uh, bizarre. And a bad, big shout out. Yesterday we lost Tom Petty. That was so sad. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, uh, so, so he, he went into cardiac arrest. What, what, when you lecture on medical emergencies, what's the low hanging fruit to talk about on medical emergencies? What do you think is the biggest things they should think about? You know, most of all, it's, 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 it's getting a good medical. Um, you know, there's always, there's always doubts about whether a procedure could be done because this patient's on blood thinners and so on and so forth. You know, those, those are typically the questions. And you know what? So be it. They have a good INR of 3.5. You go ahead, you do the extraction, and you know, you run into a situation, the patient's not bleeding. We as dentists sometimes panic, and that's the biggest thing, and, and, and rightfully so. It usually never happens to us, and when it does, we, we kind of freak out. You know, we put the gauze in the patient, and then, you know what, 30 seconds go by, we lift it up, oh, it's still bleeding. We put the gauze in there, wait another minute, we lift it up. You know, just put the gauze in there, put it under pressure, leave it for 5 to 10 minutes, don't touch it. It's the panic situation. We're trained to do the procedures. You know, we're trained to handle medical emergencies. Here's the biggest thing that dentists, and I never, never understood this. You know, we give the most injections of any profession out there. And when it comes to dropping epinephrine into somebody, all of a sudden we panic because it's outside the mouth. Where am I going to do? How do I deliver this? How I got to inject somebody in their arm or, or somewhere else? You know, if you feel safe in somebody's mouth, then jab that needle in somebody's tongue. You know, if that's where you feel comfortable and that's where you feel comfortable. 
But that's that's the biggest hurdle when we when when we're teaching people. We see, well, I've never given an injection outside the mouth. Well, it's harder to give one inside the mouth, you know. Uh, and so I think that's when when you're building confidence and you're telling people, okay, it's epinephrine. Nobody's allergic to this, you know. You're not going to kill anybody with it. Go ahead, you know. Worst case scenario, you know, the, the chances of it interfering negatively, i.e. raising up the blood pressure in somebody who's about to stroke out, fair enough, right? But for 9 out of 10 emergencies, you're going to be safe giving them epinephrine. Likewise, oxygen, right? The only time you're not going to give it is when somebody has COPD, where their thrive for, for breathing is based on the carbon dioxide level in their, in, their, in their blood, in their lungs. So, you know, apart from the small exceptions to the rule, and that's what you want to kind of teach is the exceptions, but for everything else, go the standard and have have uh, cue cards ready. I, I don't know why we think that we need to have everything memorized. You know, if you have anaphylactic shock, have a, a cue card ready that has one, two, three, four, five, six steps on it. So when it does happen, you open up your medical kit and you've got the card in front of you, you just run through the steps. You know, pilots fly planes every day, they have a checklist. And we're expected to know everything by heart? No, nobody expects it, by all means. You know, simplify your life as much as you can. And, you know, these are the things that when we, when we, when we t tell dentists, they're like, oh, I didn't know I could do that. You can. And, and just making life easier. And, and, and hopefully we, we deliver that message when we go out and teach. You know, it's funny. You, you nailed it on the head when you talked about um, pilots because if pilots had a 99.99% success rate, four major airlines a day would crash in the United States. They have to have 99 point, then six nines to have their safety record. And um, they all work from list. And they have a list for everything. And you go into a dental office and they have five operatories. And there's something different in every drawer of every operatory. Unlike a, a United, where you know they standardize operations. Um, you watch a dentist do a routine filling and the dental assistant has to get them leave the room twice. And then they have a medical emergency and they don't even know where the box is and what's going on and who's supposed to do what. And if dentists would look at, would steal all the best ideas from the Fortune 500, make every operatory a Boeing 737 like Southwest Airlines or the only airline where they only fly one airplane, make every drawer the same, standardize everything. And every time the assistant leaves the room, you call the office manager in the room and you write it up. You say, okay, I'm doing a root canal like I always do, and she had to leave the room. And then the office manager finds out, well, we only have one of these. Okay, well, we have eight operatories. So if that's a problem, buy eight because my costs are the docs 35%, the staff 25%, the, the lab bill uh, 9 the supplies 6 the facility 5 Why did I have to stop my operation to go get some slow speed because someone else used it an hour ago. And then you go do a hygiene check, and, you, and, and, and Neil's in there, and he has just a little bitty MO on number three, and you say, hey, Neil, you're a busy guy. Do you just want to do it now? And then you say, yeah, let's just do it right now. But the hygienist says, oh, well, well you, have to, you have to leave my room, and you have to go to another room because this is my room, and, and I don't have what you need in here. And it's like, no, 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 no. Every room's the same. You go start in the next room. And nine times out of ten, the hygienist say, but this is my room, and I, I can't leave my room. And you're like, are you kidding me? Are we patient-centric or dental-centric? And, uh, you know, crazy, crazy, crazy. So you also talk about marketing. What, um, what interests you in marketing? You know, I started in, I, when we started 20 years ago, it, the marketing was Yellow Pages. Uh, you know, you had to have an ad in there, and, and that's how people would find you and look you up and, and call you and get an appointment. Well, no, no disrespect to Yellow Pages, but Yellow Pages is straight to the mailbox, the blue box. Uh, there's no need for it. And... There's no need for Yellow Pages online either because everybody's doing Google searches. Uh, if not doing Google searches, then doing searches on RateMD or Facebook or you know other types of social media. So the dynamics have changed on how people are finding you. Uh, uh, and you want to be make, make sure that you know your your presence on there is mobile friendly. Uh, you want to make sure that you have the right 
information on your on your site and on your Google listing and everything else. So when somebody is standing outside your door looking for a dentist, they're not pointing down the street to somebody else. Uh, and in fact, you want to capitalize on that, that if they are at somebody else's down the street, they're pointing towards you and not towards the one that's closer. Uh, so, you know, we keep, we, we try to keep up with that. We try, we, you know, we try to advocate to dentists what, what's worked for us, what hasn't worked for us. You know, TV, uh, you know, was, was big at one time. And now we're finding a full 360 that radio is incredible. People are, like you said earlier about the podcast, people are spending a lot more time in their car. And what are they listening to? They're listening to the radio. And then you hear when our spots go on the radio that all of a sudden their phone starts to ring because we have tracking numbers associated with that specific ad. And that's another thing we do, specific tracking numbers for every ad we run. So if we do something in a magazine, in a bridal magazine or you know, uh, uh, a city magazine, we know that that phone call came from that ad. And then we can kind of tailor our, our advertising to go towards the more uh, beneficial ones for our office. And we found that radio is, is, is very successful. Same reason people want podcasts when on, on their ride home. You know, so the dynamic has, has, has changed. People thought print, print matter was completely out the door, and it was for a while, but now you're bombarded with so many emails and stuff, sometimes something sitting on your desk does catch your attention. So... We've personalized those with birthday cards and, you know, anniversary cards or, you know, you're getting congratulations. Your son graduated from school just to stay in people's face because this is a business of repetition. You know, you don't have to tell people that you need a you need a recall appointment. Sometimes seeing a birthday card on your desk or seeing a congratulations because your son got finished university. Oh, you know, such a nice guy. Let me go. You know, it's been a while since I've seen him. I think I need to make an appointment. And, you know, small things that are thinking different and out of the box are, are what's working now. You know, I'm, I went to lunch a while back with one of my lawyer buddies, and he's complaining about how marketing's going down and down and down. And, you know, he's got the back cover of the Yellow Pages. He's got billboards. He's got TV. He's got radio. He's got all that stuff. But he's obsessed with his 800 number, and he just doesn't get it. And it's like, okay, so when someone calls your 800 number, how do you know they came from – your billboard, the back of the phone book, a TV, a radio, a direct mail. And he goes, but, but, but everybody knows that number. I'm like, dude, yeah, everybody whose dad was a Tyrannosaurus Rex and their mom was a Brontosaurus, uh, but that ain't how it works anymore. I mean, the number one search on Google now is near me. So no matter what they want, dentist near me, uh, attorney near me, um, you know, personal injury attorney near me, and they're, they're not doing the 1-800 number. No. And, and, and the sad thing about marketing is that 50% works. The sad thing is, is that you don't know which 50% works. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. I just told Ryan that quote this morning. Who yeah. was, and that was from the father of, of advertising. What was that guy's name? Yeah. Um, he, was, he was my idol um, back in the day. Uh, father. Oh, Ogilvy. Ogilvy. What was his first name? David Ogilvy. David McKenzie Ogilvy. And that was his famous quote. He says, uh, half of my marketing works perfect. The other half doesn't work, but I never know which half is working. And that's why everybody is pulling out of all the traditional print because they can't track it. But when you put an ad on Google or Facebook or on your website and they click that, you have a receipt. And a lot of times people just, um, a lot of times the the young marketer says, well, I tried a Google ad and it didn't work. I tried a Facebook ad, it didn't work. I put up a website, it didn't work. Oh, like like maybe, you know, you should tinker with it. I mean, if you put a Google ad and it doesn't work, maybe um, your ads doesn't work. Maybe it's your price. Maybe it's your location. Maybe there's something with that ad. And then the other thing Ogilvy taught me so well was that um, the, he said the number one marketing mistake is for someone to change a well-working ad. And I'll never forget it. I had learned that. And the next thing I knew, I was uh, talking to this dentist, and he felt bad because he said, you know, I love to do implants. And I had this little dollar bill size ad in the, in the uh, weekly paper that comes to my small town, and it just says, dental implants, $9.99. And he says, you know, that, that damn ad gets me one to two patients a week, but I feel stupid because um, I've had the same damn ad for like 15 years. I'm like, dude, rule number one, I mean... You put a little ad in there and you get two new patients a week who want implants, do not touch that ad. Rule number one, 
quit, do not. But humans have a need to always want to tinker something. And, you know, I tell these young dentists, they'll say, well, do you think I should switch to uh, from uh, polyether to polyvinyl or polyether to oral scanning? And I, the first question I want to know is, is something broke? I mean, mm-hmm. are you having, are you, do you have a, don't, if it's not broke, God, dentistry, there's so many things you have to learn. The last thing you should start doing is changing everything that ain't broke. You know what I mean? I agree with your point, you know, and I've run the same ad for like 10 years. And, and one of the marketing guys had come up to me and said, well, you know what? That ad, after a certain period of time, becomes part of the furniture and people start ignoring it. But it's on the front page of the top right hand corner of that newspaper and it still generates patients based on my tracking number and I refuse to change it. You know, it's working. You know, how much better is it going to work? Right. And then what happens if you have it and then it, uh, it starts uh, where it doesn't work? You also talk about starting up. What, what do you like to talk about when you talk about starting up? You know, I think I think with the prices, the way uh, the way dental offices are being sold and, and the extraordinary, extraordinary amounts of dollars that are being asked, you know, we started from scratch and it is a learning curve. There is no cash flow from day one. But I think the profession is good enough. And if you have enough confidence in you, then start from scratch. The savings are huge. You build an office that's catered to you, to how you want to treat patients, to how you want to staff it. You're not inheriting anything bad or anything negative. I think, you know what, when you're ready to make that leap, by all means, make it. Uh, You know, there's don't be afraid of it. You will. You're in a good profession. You will do well. You know, and then and then small things, you know, don't blow your brains out, make it an office like the Taj Mahal, right? You know, you're going to intimidate patients the moment they walk in the door. Like, how expensive is this guy? Now, again, it depends on your environment. If you're, you know, if you're in Dubai and you're dealing with, with, with actors and actresses and seven-figure salaries, then by all means. But if you're dealing with bread and butter patients and that's what your backyard is and it is my backyard, then you know what? You have to make sure that your 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 office is welcoming and approachable to them, uh, you know. And and that's you know we have dentists up here that have rainforests in their office, and they have problems of frogs taking off on them. Uh, you know, I, again, if that's your patient base, then by all means. But be very cognizant of the fact that you know you're, it has to be a warm and welcoming environment. And again, when it comes to spending money on equipment, take a look. You know, sometimes it's worth spending that money. A pan will pay for itself in under two years. Like, what better piece of equipment can you have in your office and a better service for your patients? You know, uh, you know, people get carried away. Let me buy, you know, Zurich and this and that. You know, start with the basics. Make sure you capitalize on that. And then when you see the need and you have the patient flow to actually sell additional treatments, and by all means, work out the... Uh, the return on investment, and uh, and then if, if it's something that's right for you, it's right for you and your office. Um, you said buy a pan. How much about is a pan? A pano. Panrex is about eighty thousand Canadian. So what's that? About sixty thousand US. Okay, so then the same question. What if they're asking you? Okay, you're saying recommending a pano, eighty thousand Canadian, sixty thousand US. What about uh, even more expensive, a CBCT? You know, and again. A CBCT has has its place. You know, are you are you going to subject every patient to the level of radiation that a CBCT gives? You know, are you do you have the training to read it to make sure you don't miss anything? You know, there's sometimes liabilities that come with having far more diagnostic equipment than potentially we're trained to do. And if you're trained to do it, by all means, another good investment. You know. Radiologists do extremely well with uh, with CBCT units, uh, and again, if you feel comfortable and that's your forte, then absolutely, there's definitely a return on that. Specifically, I don't know the return on a CBCT, but I'm sure I'm sure it's good because I think a CBCT out here for eight centimeter is about two hundred and fifty dollars, two hundred and twenty dollars. Uh, so the return is there, and the CBCT is what about two hundred thousand Canadian, one hundred fifty thousand US. Is that correct, Power? Yeah. So you mentioned chair site. So so here's a big deal when we're talking to the kids. 
They say, okay, I came out with like two hundred and fifty to three hundred fifty thousand dollars of student loans. Two hundred fifty to th- to three hundred. You see it all day long. If, if they got married, had kids in school, they they could be four hundred. If they went to specialty school and became an endodontist, periodontist, pediatric dentist, I, you, you see them come out five hundred thousand dollars student loans. Then they see these CBCTs for one fifty. You'll find about that. But the next one is the the chair side milling. That's another. $150,000 deal. So I know they're wondering, okay, Neil Gajar, you got your MAGD. Do you do chair side milling or do you take a, um, or do you use a dental lab? I use a dental lab. I don't have a milling machine in my office. And for me, the economics just doesn't make sense. You know, I can get a, I can get a full Z crown out and back into my office for $120, $140. Uh, you know, it just makes sense for me to prep the tooth, temporize it, bring the patient back and seat the crown. When it doesn't fit, you know, so be it, which happens one out of 50 times. Uh, Poor impression or poor pickup or whatever it may be. But the numbers don't make sense. I I think the way a milling machine would work, in my opinion, now again, for whatever that's worth, is that the block costs you, I think, 20 bucks, and the machine is about... 200,000 Canadian or 220 Canadian, whatever it may be. If I were to have that machine, I would literally put up signs around town and say, crown for $250 and just mill out patients, volume. I think if you have volume, then that machine makes sense. I think if you're still charging what you're charging for a crown and expectations are high, people want end carriers, people want aesthetics and so on and so forth. I think those machines still sometimes fall short of that. And as such, you know, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't something that would work in my office. Not to say that it doesn't work in all offices. You, you also, when you talk about chair side billing, you, you said Cirac machine by name, and that's owned by uh, Densplice Serona. What did you think yesterday when the uh, chief executive... All of them designed? Yeah, the chief executive Jeffrey Sloven, executive chairman Brett Wise, and chief operating officer Christopher Clark all resigned. What, what, what did you make of that? <laughs> I don't know, but it seems it seems a little beyond coincidence. You know, you, know I, you know what I thought of it? You know what the first thing I thought, Ryan? You could talk about anything right now. So if I, if I called up Neil and said, hey, Neil, what do you want to talk about? And you say, my God, is, is your wife driving you crazy or you have marriage? I know that was the issue. When an advertiser says, there's two, box of, there's two scoops of raisins in every box, you know they don't have any raisins. When you look at car advertisements from uh, um, cars from Japan and Germany, they, they never talk about a warranty and bumper-to-bumper warranty because their cars are made right. But whenever an American is trying to sell you a Ford or a Chevy or a Chrysler, like, and we have a 100,000-mile warranty, we'll cover anything. It just So whatever they say, they're selling their weakest spot. And the press release is pretty interesting. And it, it says... It says, um, Monday, sweeping leadership changes, Chief Executive Jeffrey Sloven, Executive Chairman Brett Weiss, and Chief Operating Officer Chris Clark have all resigned. The dental product maker said in a statement that the resignations were not related to any issues or disagreements regarding the company's financial disclosures, accounting policies, and practices. So what does that mean? That's the only thing it's regarding. I mean, they didn't say it was because these guys are Americans and... And from and the, the the Germans wanted to try their style of man. They, they could have talked about it if they said if this said this has nothing to do with the culture of German businesses or American business. You know, it would be that yeah. if they said and none of these three men have been charged with sexual harassment lawsuits. It'd be okay. It'd be that. I mean, you just whatever the hell they say, it's not. That's what it is. That's how monkeys work. Humans are nothing more than wild, savage Homo sapiens, and they're so damn predictable. Just like when your when your granddaughter, when I got a grandson, when you see someone go out in the backyard and they leave the back door open, you see your grandson sit up and look at that open door. You know what he's thinking? Oh my God, that door is always closed. I wonder what it leads to. I mean, you can see him thinking outside their brain, and you someone better shut that damn door. And somebody did something. I assume. With everything they said, it has nothing related to. <laughs> this is why we call it dentistry uncensored. Because for every person who says that's interesting, another person says that guy is an idiot. Uh, but um, so um, you also talk about organized dentistry and volunteering. What what would you like to tell the the millennials about um, organized dentistry and volunteering? Because a lot of them say, you know, 
Neil, I have um, I have three hundred thousand dollars student loans. I, I don't want to join the AGD or the American Dental Association or the Canadian Dental Association. I'd rather leave that. I'd rather take that money and spend it on something else. What What do, what do you say about organized dentistry and volunteering? You know. First thing, I want to address that student debt thing. And I think, you know what, I know, I know it's a high student debt, but don't forget that we're not the only profession that, because when we go to lobby uh, for student debt in Washington, on behalf of the students, we've come to realize that it's not only dentists and dental students that have this extraordinary amount of debt. There are lawyers out there, there's medical practitioners out there, you know, uh, there's the whole spectrum of professionals that have a large amount of student debt. And, and, you know, I think the big education part here is, guys, remember, you are in the number one profession out there. So I know it's a huge debt. You know, your programs in the United States are phenomenal in the sense that your government will give you loans without a credit check. You will get the loans required to go to school. And on top of that, you technically don't have to pay, you, you can pay back a portion of what you make. So if you're making a smaller percentage than the regular dentist, then your payback is a percentage of what you're making. And so you can still live and function. And on top of that, your government has a 20 year forgiveness program in which you could technically, you know, ask for forgiveness of that loan after 20 years and just pay the tax liability of it. So we do have a, you know, in the United States, we, we do have a good program for debt. And, and, and one thing I do want to tell students is that, you know, don't let it consume you. Uh, you know, th there's many programs out there that are going to help you get through it and the profession itself will help you get through it. But with that said, you know, to these, to these students and new millennials coming out, one of the biggest things is get involved, get active, you know, You'll meet great guys like yourself, Howard, or, you know, other AGD members who have taken tons of continuing education, will tell you what courses are good, what courses are, you know, potential courses that, you know what, you won't get any decent takeaway messages, which are very rare. I think anytime you sit with a group of dentists, you, you do learn something. But at the same time, you know, you'll, you'll get to learn from each other, you know, like I said, a course may be on implants, but you may learn something about marketing. You may learn something about not putting an ad in yellow pages or spending money on radio and so on and so forth. What to look for, how to track it. There are so many things that, that come out of taking part in continuing education and, and being a part of AGD. And giving back to the community, giving back to the profession, helping dentists, you know, teaching them, making them better at what they do. Getting together and venting. That, my friend, is the biggest, biggest benefit of being involved with a group of dentists. It's good to know that, you know what, when that patient comes in yelling and you're always putting on your fireman suit and putting out fires at the front desk, that you're not the only one doing it, that everybody's doing it even after 60 years of practice. And how to handle it and not let it get to you, you know. Today, patient expectations are the highest we've ever seen them in this world. And, you know, we're all dealing with it. And it, it's good to know that we're not the only ones dealing with it. And forget even dentistry. Other professions are dealing with it as well. You know, we cannot, we cannot make these patients happy. They're, they're going to complain. They may even sue you. This is just part of practicing dentistry. You know, do what you're supposed to. Do it right. Have good communications. Because communications is the answer to, to, to not getting yourself in trouble 99% of the time. You know, that 1% you're not going to do anything about. You're not going to be able to rationalize or reason with this person and so be it. But it's good to be involved with that. And it's good to give back. It feels so good. It feels good to learn that you're not doing this by yourself, that everybody's in the same boat. It feels good to help people who need help, whether it be a dentist or whether it be a patient. And by doing so, I guarantee you, you will learn so much and your life will become much more enjoyable knowing that we're all fighting the same battle. You know, another question that I'm hearing a lot in the dental schools is, um, um, you know, you're in dental school or, or you're working uh, for an associate. You, you haven't tied and committed. You haven't bought a practice. 
and now they've fallen in love with someone in your country, Canada, or maybe they're a Canadian, they fell in love with someone down in... Uh, how fungible is a dental degree from the United States and Canada? If I have a dental degree from Canada, and now my lover's in the USA, how hard is it to get licensed in America and vice versa? I'm living in North Dakota, and the girl I fell in love with lives across the county line, and now I got to go be a Canadian. How fungible is a dental degree from the United States and Canada? So I studied in the, at Howard at Washington, D.C. Which uh, was named after me. Did they tell you that? <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> now, you know what? I knew we had, we had a close relationship for some reason. Uh, just but, keep spreading that rumor that Howard University was named after me. Just, just, just keep, if you say it, you know, politicians taught me one thing. No matter how many times you say the lie, eventually everyone will believe it. Believe it. But, yeah, um, absolutely. So, so you studied Great. in the United States. I did. Fantastic school. Loved it. Learned so much from that school. I owe my life to that school. Uh, the beauty coming back to Canada, because of the reciprocity agreements uh, between uh, ADA and CDA and the, and the joint commissions, uh, the only thing I had to write was the written exam, very similar to ADA Part Part 1 and Part 2. Uh, it's a one-day exam, and basically uh, you can apply for licensure after writing that, uh, that Canadian equivalency exam. Uh, on top of that, movement under NAFTA, uh, let's see how far that goes, but dentists are one of the professions that are included in NAFTA, and as such, that if I move to the U.S. and, and, and start working and show that I can earn my own living and, and pay for myself while I'm there, they'll give me a, a work NAFTA visa so I can work, and eventually I can apply for a green card. And, and likewise, in Canada, you can come here and do the same. So do you remember who Howard University was named after? I don't know who Howard University is named after. Our school itself was the Russell A. Dixon College of Dentistry, uh, named after one of the pioneers there. But uh, It was Oliver Otis Howard, uh, a ge General Oliver Otis Howard, a Civil War hero who was both the founder of the university and at the time commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau. Howard later served as president from 1869 to 1974, uh, but I think they should update that. And uh, um, just name it after Maybe myself. Yeah, <laughs> you know that was eight. I mean, come on, that was a century ago, eighteen sixty nine. Um, and 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 again, volunteering. Why? Why do you think volunteering is important? Not. I not think you know what. Likewise, God has given you a phenomenal practice, phenomenal profession to practice in. You know, you, you've been trained in it. You have the ability of changing lives. I see the uh, the ads for. Uh, uh, the smile program where they have uh, where they have oral surgeons and, and, and dentists go across the world and, and treat cleft lips and cleft palates. You know, you change people's lives. Uh, you know, you, you bring them back to function in normal society. Uh, and I think you know, as dentists, we can do a lot. And and and, and you know, I I think we should be involved. And and it doesn't mean going out of your country to do so. We have enough people in both our countries that need help, and we can give that help in however way you want to give it, whether it be dental camps or, you know, oral screening sessions and, you know, education. You know, we have so many parents that come here that, you know, their kids have milk bottle carries because nobody has educated them that, you know what, this is what could happen by giving your child a milk bottle at nighttime. You know, so small things that can lead to huge strides in prevention um, and I think that's our job and, 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 and it does bring a lot, of, a lot of enjoyment to me and I'm sure it would to everybody that when you see you know a child 20 years later 30 years later you arrested those that carries or you know what after speaking to them you know they've taken good care of their oral health and you know they have beautiful smiles and, and, and they thank you for it and it is a good feeling and what you learn from it Howard remember when you're interacting with other dentists and you're treating people that are underprivileged or, or, or need dental help, uh, dental care, ultimately, you know, you learn tips and techniques for the guy you're working with. You know, you learn things about his frustrations in his office or her office. And, and you know, I think that's, that's something that, re, you know, the reward from helping somebody and the reward from learning something. You get it both when you, when you give back. So uh, I cannot stress it anymore. 
And congratulations, you. you're the president-elect of the Academy of General Dentistry. Wow. Tell us about when, when are you the president? So I'm currently the vice president. In November, I will take on the president-elect position. And then the following November, I will become president. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, it's a line, uh, line position uh, serving as VP, president-elect. And okay, president. so say that again. Right now, you're president-elect. Vice president. Vice president-elect. And then at the meeting in October, where's that meeting at? The meeting in November will be in uh, Chicago. Well, I'll, well, I'll be uh, sworn in as president-elect. So in Chicago, you'll be president-elect. And then and n- the following year in November, where will that meeting be at? That, that's in Chicago as well. We separated our annual meeting uh, from our scientific session. Uh, Say that again? You separated... So we, 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 we originally had both the annual meeting, uh, the House of Delegates, and the scientific session uh, combined. This year was the first year we separated. We had our annual meet, uh, scientific session in, uh, in July in Las Vegas at Caesars, and we have our annual session in, with the House of Delegates in Chicago every November now. Wow. I, and, and what was the thinking behind that? The thinking behind that was predominantly we had so many delegates that would want to take part in continuing education and and be a part of the scientific session that weren't able to do so because of their duties at the house, that now this would open up a window for them to do so. So your last year's meeting was in in Las Vegas? Our our meeting this year in 2017 was in Las Vegas at Caesars, yes, in July. And where will it be in 2018? In New Orleans. It's pronounced New Orleans. No, that's... New Orleans. Only, only people not from New Orleans call it New Orleans. Uh, well, man, congratulations on that. And, and the, the other thing, how much, how much do they pay you a year to be the president-elect? I think the president-elect comes with a stipend of, I think it's, if I'm not mistaken, $40,000. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. But how many hours for how many decades did you volunteer for free? Before you came the president, the vice president elect. Technically, we still volunteer for free. It takes a lot of time out of the office. I know. You know and uh, but it's it's not the money. It's it's literally a stipend uh, to kind of cover some of the costs. But, but does it cover? Anything. But does but but does forty thousand dollars cover all the lost time uh, in your dental office and travel and expense? No, it doesn't. I, I mean, I mean, people would. I mean. I remember back in the day, I mean, you know, you would, you would not do a $10,000 day to go lecture for $1,200. And, and, and I, I keep telling people that if there's a lecture on the stage, you couldn't make more money at home. Uh, I mean, and, and right now with the ADA, two out of three dentists are members. And a lot of people say they don't want to pay the dues. I'm like, dude, not only are two-thirds paying your way, but all those guys in the ADA, they're, they're, she's, she should be going home after work. She's guilty. She wants to go home and help her children with their homework and cook dinner. And, and, and they give up so many free evenings and so many free weekends trying to make the profession better. And two out of three pay. And I don't know what percent volunteer. But, the one, but then there's one third who never pay, and so to justify their guilt of not paying, what do they do? They're always bitching the loudest on Facebook. When they're bitching real loud, what they're saying is, there's no raisins in Raisin brands. There's two scoops of raisins in every box. This, this cr- piece of crap Chrysler will last as long as a Lexus. And what they're basically saying is they're guilty for not paying their way because you got to have parents. And I remember the ADA and AGD and, and many other ones, just to the fact that I want as many people up there at Washington, D.C. and all these state and local lectures. There's so many issues, and the best way to have your profession destroyed is have no one representing the dentist and just have it be represented in Washington by insurance companies and all this stuff like that, and you're just going to hand your diploma away. I mean, when I graduated from dental school, my mom cried. When I got my FAGD, she cried again. When I got my MAGD, she cried again. And you're not willing to support just a couple of institutions that are up there fighting on your behalf all day, every day, year round. I was talking, a lot of the presidents uh, that I know that make it to the president of the AGD, ADA, they sell their practice. I mean, they're like, 
I basically will miss a calendar year. So I'm going to sell my, because I got patients, I guess. So they sell their office and go up there and fight full time. I mean, I was talking to the president of the ADA yesterday. He's, he's been home five days a month for the last year. And so, gosh darn, if, if, you, if, you, want your, if you want your grandchildren uh, to graduate from dental school and, and, and have their parents cry, you better keep fighting for this profession. Well, yeah, and again, Howard, I think I'll bring it down to the simplest thing, you know, and I, I'm sure this happens in the U.S. as it does in Canada. You know, you do, you do an occlusal filling on somebody, all of a sudden you get a letter from the insurance company, we want more information on this filling. You know, people you think actually fill that form out and send it back and get remunerated for that, you know. There are many different avenues to, to avoid payment, and you know, we work hard, and, and somebody does need to protect us, you know, whether it be government regulations or whether it be, you know, insurance tactics. Um, I think somebody needs to keep an eye out for these things, and, and yeah, whether you're a member or not, you're still getting the benefit, but at least you're, you, you know what's happening, and, and, and hopefully you think it's a good cause to be a part of. It's like the ADA and the AGD, they're like your parents. Uh, your parents weren't perfect, but they're the only parents you got. And, uh, you know, um, um, you know, the bottom line is uh, I'm just honored that there's these two great professions that have been around over a century fighting to make this the sovereign profession that it is. And congratulations on becoming the vice president-elect and good luck on uh, becoming president-elect. And God help you when you're the president. And I hope, uh, I hope when you're done, you will not say, that was crazy. I'm going to learn how to say no. Next time someone asks me to volunteer for anything, I'm going to run out of the room and yell fire. Um, thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. Thank you for all that you've done for the Academy of General Dentistry. And it was an honor to podcast interview today. Well, Howard, I just want to say thank you for what you've done for dentistry. You know, you, the, the community that you've made is, is a God's gift to dentistry. It truly, truly is. You know, allowing everybody to interact, allowing people to learn from each other, allowing dentists to vent, you know, making the profession better for both dentists and the public. You know, you couldn't have done a better job at that. And, you know, a heartfelt congratulations to you and, 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 and many God blesses for that. Yeah. Well, on that note, thank you so much, and a big shout out, and thank you to Ryan for making uh, this podcast possible because Dad could not have uh, technically done it without him. But uh, I hope you have a rocking hot day. Thank you so much.